Well, good morning, gentlemen. Maybe some of the gentle women will join us in a moment. It's wonderful to be back. Uh, it's been two weeks since I've been here on a Tuesday. Uh, last Tuesday, my wife and I went to Colorado Springs for a marriage uh, getaway, just a time for us to be together as husband and wife and uh, take a few days off to uh, change pace and so forth. And so it was a tremendous blessing. Uh, and then the, obviously the week before that, we were uh, with a group of people here from the church um, at the Ark Encounter in Kentucky. I had a great time of fellowship with everyone. And, uh, you know, it's one of, the, I think the Ark Encounter specifically would be one of those things to put on a bucket list if you had a bucket list of things to do sometime when you can. It is uh, a really well done. And uh, at least for me, it wasn't any new information, but to to walk inside this full-size Noah's Ark and to see the size of it and how um, reasonable it is to be able to have two of every kind of animal in it, along with supplies for not only the animals, but supplies for Noah and his family. All that just, it just makes very, uh, very good sense or common sense. So anyways, if you get a chance, and you'd like to go, I think it's worth putting that on your, your bucket list of things to do. Um, of course, we have in town here the Institute for Creation Research, which does fabulous things. It's just not the uh, physical art that you can walk into. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, I certainly recommend uh, ICR, or Institute for Creation Research. And you don't have to do a 13-hour bus trip to get there. You can just... <laughs> You can just uh, hop over there for the afternoon or something like that. So, um, so great to be back. Great to be with you. We will be in John chapter 6. And uh, John chapter 6 is a long chapter. So we're going to try to do the first 40 verses. And then next week come back and do the balance of this. Uh, some highlights that we have, of course, in, in John chapter 6, the first half of it or roughly, is uh, one of the feedings of the multitudes. This particular one is the feeding of the 5,000. And then Jesus also gives them some instructions that we're going to find them out on the lake again. But this time Jesus isn't with them when the storm comes up and we'll see Jesus ministering to them. And some of the other gospels give us some additional details on that. So let's go to the Lord. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be here this morning the opportunity to look at your word. Father, I thank you for Taylor and others who have filled in over the last two weeks in various ways. Lord, I ask that you would bless each one. Lord, I ask that you would bless this morning as we look at your word, Father. May your word resonate deeply within each of our own hearts. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 6, we'll pick it up here in verse 1. Looking at, we'll start off by looking at the first four verses. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which was the Sea of Tiberias. And so for those of you who are familiar, uh, Tiberias is a city on the sea. It's the same sea, Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he had performed for those who were deceased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. So there's this great multitude that's attracted to Jesus. And we find that they're primarily attracted because of the miracles. And again, the healing, those who were dise diseased or sick. And, and so the crowds are attracted, just like any of us. I mean, shoot. Anybody that's ever gotten sick in their lives or has a family member, a loved one that's sick, and you hear about some place, you know, that does special treatments for cancer or they do special treatments for that, uh, we flock to those kinds of places. Uh, people have been doing that forever. Um, 
So we have this, mir- this great multitude that is following Jesus. And then John gives us a bit of detail that isn't in some of the other gospels. All four gospels include this miracle, but John specifically says that it was at the time of Passover. The time of Passover doesn't necessarily uh, make any difference in our general story, except to explain why there would be a large crowd. It's quite possible that people were in the process of getting out or Galilee, the Sea of Galilee is in northern Israel, and they're traveling or getting ready to go down to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so they may have been traveling through. There may have been individuals from other parts of the Roman Empire that were Jewish traveling down to Jerusalem. There would be a heightened sense of spirituality or at least uh, an idea like at Christmas time or Easter time, there's a greater sense even in our culture of an awareness of things. And those things could have been going on, which would have, of course, attracted a larger crowd or a larger group of people. They had heard perhaps stories about this man who was healing people. And so they would come and be attracted to see them. And of course, Passover refers back to the days of Moses. Remember that prior to Moses, the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, and then God did a series of miracles or plagues through Moses, and the culmination was, again, spreading the blood of a lamb on your doorpost. And if you did that in faith, your firstborn male son was safe, but if you didn't do it in faith, they suffered. And, of course, that's what led to the Egyptians kicking the Jews out. So we can see some parallels here with this idea that our Jesus is our Passover lamb and to have a relationship with Jesus is one by faith, that if we express that faith, if we commit ourselves to faith in Christ, that he will rescue us or save us or redeem us. So we can see those sort of parallels and perhaps that was intentional by John. Verse 5, then Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming towards him. And he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little So Jesus sees the the needs. He is moved by the crowd. Some have speculated that Jesus went off to the other side of the Sea of Galilee on purpose to kind of have some alone time to get away from the crowds. And of course, the crowds follow Jesus. And so instead of turning the crowds away, Jesus ministers to them and he teaches them. And he puts Philip specifically to a test. Now, you might, like me, ask, why would Jesus pick on Philip? Well, we know that Philip is from that area or that region. And earlier in John, John chapter 1, we knew that uh, Philip was from Bethesda, which was near this place where the miracle took place, according to Luke chapter 9. So perhaps Jesus turns to Philip because it's something very practical. It'd be like you and I coming to a new town or a new area. We might ask somebody, hey, where's a good hamburger place? Or where's, where's this thing or that thing? And we would just naturally ask somebody who might be more familiar with this. But he did this specifically to put Philip to the test. And Philip's response is wonderful. Uh, He has a very practical plan. He says 200 denarii is not enough. So Philip recognizes the problem. First and foremost, we don't have the resources to feed these people. You know, I didn't bring a bag full of food. I don't have a trailer full of food to bring to people. And even if we did have the financial means to pay for it, It's way more than we could ever do. And so you can see Jesus setting Philip up to point Philip and the rest of the disciples, because they're active participants in this, is that whatever they do have is not enough. You ever run into that difficulty, especially in your walk with the Lord? Maybe you're facing some tragedy, some difficulties in your life, and you come face to face with the idea that what resources I do have are not enough. I think, of course, in our spiritual endeavors that we 
by ourselves are not enough to save ourselves. And I think for each of us at some point in our spiritual journey to, that led to the point of our accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior, we came to that point of saying, I am not enough. I can't make myself good enough. I can't do this. I can't do that. And even if I could, I can't maintain it long enough that I could earn my way to heaven. That's the basis of our Christian message, is that none of us is good enough. And even if we are good by the world's standards, we're not good enough by God's standards. And even if you, by hook or crook or by self-determination, discipline yourself to be a good person by other people's ideas, by God's ideas, you're never going to be good enough. I think, again, the classic example from Jesus that the law says you shall not murder, but I say to you, if you have hatred in your heart, my goodness, we're all guilty of that. And then he goes again, not to commit adultery, but have lust in your heart, and we're all guilty of that. And then who can stand before God? And I believe this is one of those lessons that Jesus is teaching you and I and his disciples that we are not sufficient. We don't have enough for ourselves. Philip's knowledge of the local area and the idea that 200 denarii is impressive, but 200 denarii would be about six months worth of wages, half a year. So imagine for yourself, take whatever your salary is, whatever your income is, and some need is pressing, a need that you may even want to help, but it's half of your salary for the year. That's the scenario that Philip and the disciples were in. And so this is where the, this is the stage that they're set. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they with so many? So Andrew says, hey, there's somebody who does have his lunch with him, let's might say. I'm willing to share, somebody might say. I'm willing to, to help out, but it's nothing in comparison to the need. It might be some, you know, you, we hear things about different needs in Christian ministries or missionaries or, or something else, and somebody says, oh, we need, you know, X amount of money, or we need to be able to feed, you know, these people. And you say, but all I have is $5. What's this in comparison to this great need? And as you're familiar with the story, you understand that the willingness to share, the willingness to step in, even if your resources are not sufficient in themselves, is exactly what God would want us to do. We're called to share, even if we don't have a lot. Now, the barley loaves would be small loaves. They're kind of, we might think of them as sort of large rolls today. It's not, if you go back there in the back, there's those big, long French rolls of, you know, bread that looks like a family could feed on it for a week or something like that. Uh, these are not that size of loaves. These are more like a, a like a, again, a large roll. And then barley was the cheapest of the grains that they would use. Uh, barley would be an undesirable grain. It was a grain that they typically used for horses or for their donkeys. It's not that humans can't eat it. It's just not desirable. And so it might be in our scenario today, it's like, well, yeah, there's some food here, but it's, it's really for my hamster. And I, I know I can eat these seeds, but I don't really want to. That, that sort of idea. And, and so... Um, Understand again, whatever our resources are, they are insignificant in comparison to God. And even this barley and a few small fish, and please, again, it's talking about small fish. We're not talking about a halibut or a salmon or something else where a family can feed off of it. This was really a young boy's or a lad, uh, somebody, maybe he's 10 or 12. This was really his lunch. That's what it was. So in our vernacular today, you know, it might be a, a sandwich and an apple and, and a bag of chips. Maybe enough for the boy for the day, but certainly nothing in comparison to the large crowd. 
In verse 10, notice Jesus gets things organized. He knows what he's going to do. Then Jesus said to them, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place. So the men sat down and numbered about 5,000. And of course, I think you're all familiar with this. That is counting only the men, not the women and children. And we understand from the, from the crowds that there was much more than just men there, but 5,000 men. And we typically call this the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 12, uh, I'm sorry, verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, then he gave, had given thanks. He distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. If you take the grain, the barley grain, before you turn it into flour, before you bake it into bread, it's able to reproduce, isn't it? You can take that grain, it's a seed that you can plant and grow more barley from it. But once you mill that barley grain, it becomes flour and it cannot reproduce. You can throw it all day long and all it's gonna turn into is a lump of flour. May even turn into a little bit of a doughy consistency. And then of course you take that flour, that barley flour, and then you go and you bake it. And again, you can leave a loaf of bread outside and outside of it getting moldy, nothing is gonna happen to it. So indeed, this is a supernatural miracle that Jesus is gonna do. And it might recall, or John may have in his mind from the Old Testament, this idea of God being our shepherd. Psalm 23 that most of us are familiar with, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, which is exactly what Jesus did here. Sit down on this grass and he leads me beside still waters. The still water is not stagnant water. It's water that you can drink from. It's the idea that God provides for us like the good shepherd. Psalm 23 is a wonderful psalm. If you'd like to read that for yourself and the idea of a perspective of somebody who's caring for sheep. Sheep are wonderful animals, but they're not the smartest. Sheep are uh, useful animals, but they lack protection. Sheep without a shepherd to protect them, turn into, well, oftentimes they end up being uh, food for the wolves or the coyotes or whoever else because they don't have, a, they're not fast runners, they don't have horns, they can't kick. Uh, and then again, if the sheep's uh, hair or fur is not trimmed, it turns into this huge matted mess and then the animal becomes super heavy with just their fleece on them, their, that is their fur, and they need to be trimmed in order to uh, survive or to be healthy. And so all those things Jesus, I think, fully understood when he looked at us and says, you are sheep and I'm your great shepherd. Moving on to verse 12. So when they were filled, notice again, this is filled. This is not, oh, I had a taste. Have you ever gone someplace and, and you're really hungry and all they have is, I don't know, cheese and crackers as an example, or little tiny sandwiches or whatever else, and you, you kind of like, I really was hoping they would be serving a meal here, not just, you know, this tiny little cucumber sandwich or something else like that. And, and so you restrain yourself. But notice in this case, that's not what they're doing. They ate until they were satisfied, until they were full. And then after they were full, now notice, Jesus is the one that's replicating the food. He is in front of them, taking a, piece, a barley loaf, handing it out to his 12 disciples, and he keeps handing it out to the disciples. The disciples are the distributors, but the bread is not multiplying in their hands. It's in the hands of Jesus. And the disciples, especially Philip and Andrew, certainly know there's a large crowd and all we've got is five barley loaves and a couple of fish. So he clearly understands how much food there is. And now we'll see them, each disciple, go around and collect over the scraps, the leftovers. This is what happens. Jesus in verse 12. And so they were filled. He said to his disciples, that'd be the 12 disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves. 
which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men who had seen the sign that Jesus did said, this truly, excuse me, is this truly the prophet who is to come into the world? So again, each disciple gets to gather up why the 12 baskets? Because there are 12 disciples and they gathered up the leftovers. What was left over? Notice the disciples' response. They clearly understood that a miracle had happened in their midst. They understood that they had five barley loaves and now they each have a basket full of scraps or leftovers. And I don't think the scraps were like the little, you know, crusty corners that nobody wants to eat. I think, again, they were like half loaves or some significance that they certainly could continue to eat off of it. And notice the response. Is this the prophet? This would be the prophet that Moses had predicted. Matter of fact, if just to follow along here, um, here we go. Let me find the right verse. There we go. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, the Lord our God will rise up for you a prophet like me. That would be like Moses. Moses is the author, the writer of Deuteronomy. The Lord will raise up a prophet for, for you like me from the midst, from your brethren, and him you shall hear. So if you were a good, studious, religious Jew at that day, you would have understood that there were prophets or prophecies about a prophet coming. And certainly we understand from the context of the New Testament that many Jews had an anticipation for a Messiah or a prophet to come, but they had a different mindset than what Jesus was. Again, if you're familiar with the Jewish culture that time, they were fully Jews, or many of them. They were religious, but they were under the authority of the Roman government. One of the qualms that the Jews had when they wanted to kill Jesus is they didn't have the authority as Jews to kill Jesus. They had to go to the Romans to ask permission to be able to put Jesus to death, to exercise that capital punishment. But as you remember from the Old Testament, capital punishment was not a uh, everyday occurrence, but it certainly was one of the judgments for those who had committed gross sin. The woman caught in the act of adultery, the religious judgment was for her to be stoned. You know, also for the man, they conveniently forgot about the man. But you understand that from a, if you're a religious Jew, the ultimate act of dealing with somebody who you felt was blasphemous or had broken God's law severely was to kill them. And yet they're not allowed to do that. And so they desperately wanted to get rid of the Roman government. And of course, we have, if you only had the Old Testament as your resource, you read things about Jesus coming back as the conquering king, how everyone will gather together to worship him. I think about, for example, Ezekiel and Ezekiel's brand new temple and just the marvelous descriptions that we have in Ezekiel. Now, you and I as New Testament believers have this tremendous advantage of looking back and saying, no, Jesus came the first time as the suffering servant. And we look forward to a second coming as the conquering king. But if you didn't have that context like you and I have to be able to look back at the crucifixion of Christ, it's not surprising that you would blend those together. Matter of fact, most of them thought that the nation of the Jews was the suffering servant, that because they were under bondage, that fulfilled that suffering servant prophecy, and they were anticipating both a political and a religious leader to raise up on the scene to be able to deliver them. And so it would be natural for them to look to this prophet that Moses had prophesied about. And of course, most of the Jews, especially the religious leaders, missed it because they had this preconceived idea of what Jesus would be and do and the Jesus that they encountered didn't do what they wanted. Anybody ever have that issue? You have certain things you want God to do? You ever prayed certain ways? God, I want you to, and then you give God all this great advice, and I'm so thankful that the Lord is patient with us. He says, okay, Dwayne, I heard your advice, but I have a much better plan. 
And usually, as we look back through our lives, we can see how good God was in working in our lives and so thankful that we didn't get to do what we picked along the way. But anyways, the response to the crowd is to say, or excuse me, the disciples, is to say Jesus must be the Messiah or the prophet, but not the prophet that they were thinking about. You may recall that the disciples argued with each other about who could be the greatest in God's kingdom. That would be like in our vernacular today, some, some rising politician, and maybe he's your high school buddy, and you say to him one day, man, when you become governor of the great state of Texas, would you make me the commissioner of something? And you think, man, because we're friends since high school, he's sure to do that because he's this rising political star. But the disciples had that same mentality towards Jesus. Moving on to verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountains by himself. Notice Jesus understood that the crowd of 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, because they had been filled, their bellies were full, the disciples had seen the miracle firsthand, and they all said, let's make him king. Let's make him king. We'll force his hand. Sometimes even we as Christians do that. We want to force God into doing something. God, I want you to do this, and I'm going to, you know, like a little kid, I'm going to hold my breath until, God, you do what I want. Or, you know, God, I promise I won't, you know, do this thing until you do that or something else like that. And that's not the way God works. God is not dependent upon our actions, nor is he one that is moved by our, our vows or our commitments to do something else. No, God is motivated by love. And he does love you and he wants the best for you. I used to love it when my kids were little because I would, I would chuckle at them when they would want something and they would be fervent about it. God, Dad, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. I was talking to another family who has a couple of dogs and they were sharing how their daughter wanted a dog and their daughter promised to exclusively take care of the dog. They would do everything for the dog. And if you've ever had pets in your home, you've probably been through the same scenario. Within three days of getting this dog, the daughter totally forgot about the dog. Doesn't feed it, doesn't you know, take it out for walks, anything else. And the husband has taken on the responsibility of this dog that the teenage daughter had vowed up and down that she would do whatever it takes in order to have a pet. And I think all of us have been, as parents, been through scenarios like that. Or we've, we've seen things like that. And sometimes we think that God, if we just make a vow to God, he'll do what we want. So they're trying to force Jesus into becoming a king. But Jesus, understanding those things, left them. And he went away for a season to be by himself. Now, Jesus had been on the Sea of Galilee. He crossed over. He fed the 5,000. He's been teaching. The other gospels tell us that the crowd was gathered together, not because they, there was a food truck there, but because they were, Jesus was teaching and they were hoping that Jesus would perform another miracle and they could see that. So after Jesus has poured himself out, he's done all that he can for these people, he desires to have a little time off. And there's nothing wrong with that. And again, for you and I to be able to take little breaks, whether that's a, a, a day or, or something else, a family vacation, or just to have a day that you're going to say, you know what, today's just going to be a rest day. That's a wonderful thing. And Jesus did that same thing. Verse 16, and when the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was already dark and Jesus did not come with them. So it's a little different story. This is not the Jesus falling asleep in the back of the boat. This is his disciples crossing over. Now, of course, his disciples are a portion of them are fishermen. This is their home territory. This is where they go to go fishing. And they are familiar with this. 
This is not an unusual thing, and it seems like the disciples head off without any great um, commotion. They weren't afraid in the uh, other account of Jesus being asleep in the boat. Remember, Jesus rebukes them because they were afraid. It seems like they go off in their own. They're, they're doing well. But it was already dark. But being fishermen and accustomed to the lake, or at least several of the disciples being fishermen, it wasn't that big of a deal. And I think their intention was simply to row across the lake in the evening time or at night. But God has a different story for them, what, doesn't he? Um, then the sea arose. So they started off, but then the sea arose because of a great wind was blowing. So it's not just the wind that was blowing against them or making the difficult passage, but now the waves are up. You ever, if you look at Rick, Lake Ray Hubbard, when it gets windy out here, you can see those waves. And Lake Ray Hubbard is small in comparison to the Sea of Galilee, and it's broken into all kinds of little fingers. But the Sea of Galilee, when the wind gets blowing, there's a set of cliffs or a valley that the wind can howl through that magnifies that wind and causes extremely large waves to come up on it. Now, again, this is something akin to a a rowboat. It's an open boat, probably has a sail on it, but it's akin to what we would think of as a rowboat. So they rowed about three or four miles. Then they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near to the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. So they had made it about halfway across the lake. They had been struggling all night. Other gospel accounts give us, gives us a little bit more information. Uh, we believe that they had arrived, they were rowing probably in the, the 3 to 6 a.m. time period. Uh, Matthew gives us that idea uh, Mark tells us that they had rowed about halfway across the lake. So you see here the idea that it's the middle of the night, the wind is howling, the waves are there, and they're struggling to get all the way there. In Matthew's account, they seem to be frustrated with their progress. It says in Matthew's account that it was about the fourth night or watch of the night, which again gives us that 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. time period. They would rowed six or eight hours, and yet they're only halfway across. Anybody ever do something where you think in your mind, or maybe you've done it yourself in the past, this should take me 30 minutes, this should take me an hour, but it turns into an all-day project. I uh, came home Sunday night uh, from this time with my wife. It was late, our flight was delayed, walk into the house. By the time we got back to the house, it was about one in the morning. And we walk into the house and we hear a hiss. Sss, not a snake, but a water leak. One of our water lines underneath the kitchen sink had sprung a leak. And so um, guess what I did yesterday? Replaced water lines and in the process of turning off the water valve underneath the sink, the water valve itself leaks, so I gotta replace the Got to replace not only the faucet and the lines leading to it, I got to replace the, the turnoff valve. And, you know, anyways, and I, of course, figured, hey, since I'm under here, I might as well put in a new garbage disposal. It's 20 years old. Let's put in a new one, and that way it'll be all taken care of. And in my mind's eye, I would be done by noon, let's say. After three trips back and forth to Home Depot, I wasn't done until about 11 o'clock. I had this great end idea that I could get this fixed. It'd be straightforward. And it just turned into one thing after another thing. All that to say, sometimes we in our own abilities think that we can do something only to discover along the way it takes much more time and it's easy for us to get frustrated. I have to admit, I think especially after the third trip looking for a part again, it's not that I had messed things up, it's just that as I was taking things apart, I discovered um, I needed a shutoff valve, and then I needed this, and I needed that, that I didn't know until I'd taken everything apart. So after the third trip to Home Depot, there was a level of frustration. 
Um, and then also embarrassment because I don't want to run into the same guy running the plumbing department for the third time. I wanted to pretend like I knew what I was doing. So those things can happen. But notice what happens here with Jesus. As the disciples are in the midst of that, they are afraid. Now, the other gospels tell us that they think that maybe Jesus was a ghost or a spirit, and they didn't know it was Jesus himself. And so we have here in verse 20 Jesus' comment when he says, It is I. Do not be afraid. What a comfort. You know, whether it's running back and forth to Home Depot or other much more tragic events of our lives, if we could remember it is Jesus, do not be afraid. Sometimes there are tremendously difficult things that happen in our lives, but we need to remember that Jesus said he would not leave us nor forsake us, that he will be our constant companion, our shepherd, it doesn't mean that we won't have difficulty in our life. What it does mean is we don't go through those difficulties alone. And so let that phrase harmonize in your mind. Do not be afraid if you're walking with Jesus. And again, once they had recognized Jesus, Jesus was with them. They got into the boat and then boom, they're at the shore. Again, according to the other gospel accounts, they were about halfway. Then the next thing they know, they're at the shore. Verse 22, on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except the one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? So again, they're, they're observant. They've noticed, okay, the disciples got in the boat, but Jesus didn't. And then the next morning, they're like, Jesus is gone too. How in the world did you get here? And of course, again, remember, Jesus has drawn away from the crowds. He specifically is getting away from the crowds. We know from other gospel accounts that Jesus would frequently gather or go away either in the evening or early morning just to have what you and I might call quiet time, just a time away from the crowds and time to commune with his heavenly father. Certainly, Jesus was able to, and we are able to, in the midst of our days, call out to the Lord. You may be driving down the road, and you can call out to the Lord as you're driving, but it's not the same as a designated, quote-unquote, quiet time. Now, please understand, a quiet time isn't about the volume of Bible that you read or how fervent you might be in prayer. Quiet time really is just simply it's dedicated time. It could just be a few moments of you and God. It might be a, before you get in the car for first thing in the morning or before you go and do something or before you get going with your various projects that you just settle yourself and say, Jesus, I commit my day to you. Lord, is there things that you want me to do? I've got this plan, this agenda, but Lord, if you have something else, show me. In my case, it was going to Home Depot three times instead of just one time. Uh, it wasn't my plan, but it certainly was part of God's plan for that day. And so having that quiet time is, again, a time of you just sitting before the Lord. It could be you just thinking about God. It could be you praying. It can be you reading. It can be a time of worship songs that you sing along with. But the idea is that you're setting your heart for the Lord. If Jesus did this being perfect... Should we not also do it? But then again, notice that Jesus, when the crowds came to him, didn't send them away. He didn't say, get out of here. How in the world did you find me? Or didn't hide behind a rock or in a cave or anything else. Verse 26, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. The signs would be miracles that Jesus had performed to demonstrate that he was God, to demonstrate that he had the ability to forgive sins. That's why Jesus performed these various miracles or signs. 
to display his authority over nature. And it would have been fine if the crowds came to Jesus and said, Jesus, we saw you perform this miracle, and now we know you're God. Instead, what the crowd did is, hey, that was pretty good bread. I haven't had that good barley bread in a while. Would you give me some more barley? Somehow Jesus' barley, maybe they thought, tasted better or filled them. But of course, us being filled with food for a period of time is certainly temporary. And so Jesus knows this, and he's going to correct them or take this as an opportunity to teach them. Verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Again, the bread that we have in the back hallway is wonderful. It's great bread until it turns green and moldy and so forth. It does do that. Food will do that, whether it's a piece of chicken or a piece of bread, it will decay. But Jesus is telling us not to labor only or simply for food or things that are perishable. Sometimes we labor for things. We labor for a car or a house or TV or whatever else or a vacation or something. But those are all temporary things. Instead, we're to labor for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? <laughs> it's interesting. Jesus says, come to me. If we were to break down what he said, he basically says, come to me for eternal life. And they say, well, we want to do the works of God. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. We have lots of religious things that we can do. We can go on missions trips. We can, we can uh, help out at orphanages. We, there's all kinds of things that we can do. In different church circles, they would say, give more money or whatever it might be. And those are all good things. There's nothing wrong with helping to support a missionary or those that are less fortunate than yourself. I'm not suggesting that's wrong. There's, not, there's good things in that. But even as devout Christians, we can become consumed with doing stuff instead of who we're trusting in. And what did Jesus say? This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Jesus' first and foremost commandment, when they asked him, what do we need to do? He said, trust and believe. Jesus' foremost command to us is not do something, but to trust. Understand your trust or your faith, your belief will result in actions, but we got to keep the order right. We need to trust first. We need to believe. We need to rely upon first. Then those other things will come. It's easy, especially in Christendom, to put actions before faith. It's easy for us to say, yes, I'll go on a missions trip, but never really ask God if you should go. It's easy for us to say, well, I'll just write a check for this thing, if any of you still write checks. But I'll send money to this thing. You're, mot you know, you're up late and you see the, the sad pictures of kids that need help, and you're just like, well, I, I want to do something, so I'm going to send money. Please, I'm not saying that sending money is wrong. But faith or trust is the primary thing. Then let your faith, your trust, your belief in God dictate your actions. Don't think that because I, I helped an old lady take her food out or her groceries out to the car that that replaces faith. As James clearly says to us, your faith should be put into action. So Jesus isn't saying don't do any action. He's saying get the order right. Believe in me first. Verse 30, therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform? So they totally miss it. Jesus says, believe, and they say, okay, perform another sign. Do a show for us. Unfortunately, I think many times we as Christians act that same way. 
God says, says to us, believe or to trust. Trust me in the midst of this tragedy. And our response is, I'll wait, in a half an, uh, wait a half hour. And then, Jesus, I expect you to perform some great miracle or sign. Sometimes he doesn't do that. Sometimes he doesn't work that way. Again, remember, Jesus' first commandment, first instruction, at least here, is to believe or to trust. He goes on to say, Your fa-, they go on to say, the crowd that is, verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So the crowd certainly remembered about God providing miraculously through Moses. They're going back to that. Remember that manna, they, manna literally means what is it? It was a, like a doughy substance of some sort that would fall like dew on the ground and they would pick it up and they could bake it and make bread out of it. And they ate literally from the hand of God. And they said, God gave us bread from heaven. Verse 32, and Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus, of course, is again referring to himself. Moses was the the spiritual political hero for the Jews. For us, it might be the, you know, the wrapping together of the pilgrims and George Washington and, and Abraham Lincoln or whoever else that you might think of as a great hero, a great leader. And they attribute all those things to Moses forgetting conveniently that it was God who was working behind the scenes. It was God that was actually performing the miracle for Moses. And Jesus says to them, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven, referring to himself, and gives life to the world. Jesus' primary concern is not that their bellies be filled or that their lame be healed. Or their dead be raised. And Jesus did all those things. But his primary focus and concern is spiritual life or eternity. There's nothing wrong with us praying for healing for somebody. There's nothing wrong with us ministering and helping somebody with something. But you and I as Christians need to make sure our focus is on eternal life. That if you're helping somebody... As an example, taking, helping somebody take groceries out to their car, may it be in your mindset, I wonder if this will lead to an opportunity to share the gospel. I'm sending this money to this place, but I'm sending it not just because they moved on my heartstrings, but because I'm hoping that this would encourage and be used in some way or for, fashion for the gospel to go forward. Many, are fami- many of you are familiar with Jeremy and Lori Cooper, and they're, they're helping with specifically a ministry in Haiti, our father's house. Our father's house is essentially a private school where they're teaching the little kids and they're providing food and shelter for them. And if they stopped there, they would be going short. But our father's house is involved in not only educating the children in a school sense, and providing food for them, but they're also providing spiritual guidance and direction. They're actively engaged in discipleship. They're actively engaged in sharing the gospel message. And so, yes, they are providing for children. Yes, they are providing food and shelter, but they're also providing that spiritual input. And that's that's the way that Christians ought to be. There's nothing wrong with you sending money or going on a trip or doing something that practically helps somebody, but make sure that it's all also about kingdom business. Maybe your neighbor needs help moving something, or maybe they're sick and you decide, I'm going to mow their lawn for them, whatever it might be. That's all great, and I encourage you to do that, but make sure it's an eternal perspective in the midst of what you're doing. May you help your neighbor as an act of love. And then when you have a chance to talk with them, you get the chance to say, well, I I did this because Jesus has loved me. And then let that be an opening to share the gospel more and more. 
verse 34, they responded and they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Now the life, of course, here is referring to eternal life, not just bread for your daily substance. And he who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. Notice the two commandments or instructions. We must come to Jesus, and then we also must believe. We must turn ourselves over to him. We must allow him to be our leader, our master. Verse 36, but, he's, but I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Again, Jesus is addressing this crowd, this crowd that's motivated by getting a free lunch. And they say they want eternal life. They say they want all the benefits of being a Christian in our modern vernacular. You know, I want that hope. I want that comfort that comes from Jesus Christ in spite of the difficulties. I want those things. But we must believe. That's the requirement. In all the Father has given me, verse 37, all the Father gives me, I will come to him. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Again, that reminds us of, of the John chapter 3 passage where, especially John 3, 16, for all who come, whoever believes shall be saved. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, and that all he has given me, I should, I should lose nothing but should raise up again on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. The will of God our Father is that we would have everlasting life. Now, there's conditions to that. We have already mentioned John 3:16. whosoever believes... Jesus here in this passage has clearly taught that we must believe. It's more than just actions, but it's a trust, a reliance. In our, again, our modern vernacular, we might say it's coming to Jesus. It's repenting of our sins, repenting of our selfishness or our self-centeredness and being Christ-centered as opposed to being self-centered. But the, on God's side of this equation, he will be faithful. If we come to him, he will meet us. But if we reject him, we can't expect any help. That's like if you need help with something and somebody says, hey, can I help you? And you say, no, I got it. Then that person is off the hook and you, you and I would be wrong if we expected them to help us even though we just turned them down. Somebody says, hey, my car's broken. Gee, I wish I had a ride. And you say to them, okay, I'll come pick you up, give you a ride. And they say, no, no, I don't want to ride. I don't want to inconvenience you. Well, you said you needed a ride. I offered you a ride. And if you're not willing to accept it, then guess what? You get no ride. And it's not uh, complicated like that. Now, certainly walking with Jesus on a daily basis is simple in concept, but sometimes difficult to put into practice. And I don't mean intellectually, but oftentimes with our hearts. We know that God wants us to follow him. We know there are things or behaviors that God says, don't do that because that will cause harm or hurt. And he says to us other things, do these things because this will bless you. And in our flesh, we struggle sometimes because our flesh is still attracted to this thing, even though we know it's not the best for us. You may have noticed I've lost some weight recently. I've been on a diet uh, trying to be healthier uh, I'm not sick or anything else. This is an intentional thing. But I've, I've been, uh, over the last several months, intentional about trying to be healthier and to eat better and so forth. That doesn't mean that the temptation for the chocolate cake doesn't still tempt me. It certainly does. But I know, at least at this current stage of my diet plan, that if I eat the chocolate cake, it's going to set me back a lot. And I'm not saying that chocolate cake is evil, but you, you get the idea that if you want to accomplish something, there's something that still can be tempting to you, but you have to say, no, I'm not doing that. In my case, I say no to the chocolate cake because 
so far have been successful with losing the weight and I don't want to go backwards. I haven't yet met my, my goal, but I'm, I'm heading in that direction. And so I'm intentional and I have to be, at least on a personal level, I have to be intentional about this every day. It's not something that I can just do, you know, when I feel like it, I've got to do it regularly. And honestly, there are times when the chocolate cake really looks tempting. And I hope that you understand this analogy that God says to us, there are times or things that we might be drawn to in our flesh that God says, no, let go of that. And it's not that God is mean, it's that he really wants to bless us. I think, for example, uh, God says for us to forgive others, even though they've hurt us. And maybe they even, never even apologize or don't even recognize that they hurt you. But God's instruction is still to forgive them because Christ has forgiven you. And that battle there oftentimes is, but if I forgive them, I somehow am excusing or endorsing that other person's evil behavior. And that's a lie from Satan because you forgiving them doesn't let them off the hook. Is you're letting God deal with them and no longer are you in that revenge mode. And that's what forgiveness generally is. And as you forgive, God says, I will bless you. You will no longer be in bondage to bitterness or unforgiveness that that past event, whatever it might be, no longer controls you. And that's why God calls us to forgive. However, if we hold on to that grudge, then it consumes us. And we end up every day thinking about or frequently thinking about how we're going to get back at so-and-so. Or maybe you don't even think about it, but the moment that person's name or Right now, I mentioned unforgiveness, and now I've triggered things in your heart or your mind that you'd be able to genuinely say, no, I've forgiven them because Jesus has forgiven me. And God wants to bless us that way. And so sometimes it's difficult. I understand that struggle. But the concept is simple. I will follow Jesus. I will believe in him. I will trust him. And that's what Jesus is saying to this crowd. Remember, it started off with a crowd who were attracted because Jesus was healing from diseases. And who doesn't want to be healed from a disease? I mean, you have an ingrown toenail, you want to be healed from that. You have cancer, you want to be healed from that. You have COVID, you want to be healed from that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be healed. But then as they were attracted and they're listening to the teachings of Jesus, Jesus had compassion on them and gave them physical food. Because God had provided physical food, all of a sudden, they changed their focus from the diseases to, hey, that was a good lunch. Let's get some more food. Jesus goes across the lake. The disciples are struggling in their own strength. They haven't made it there. They're frustrated. And life can be frustrating, can't it? If you don't have frustrating events in your life, please come talk to me because you're superhuman then, because all of us have things that frustrate us in life. It may be big, it may be big or small. So the crowds catch up with Jesus on the other side of the lake, and they are attracted specifically because they got fed physically. And then Jesus turns that on them and says, I want to give you the bread of life. I want to give you eternal life. I don't want to feed you for a day. I don't want to feed you for a month. I want you to experience eternal life with me. To experience eternal life with Jesus, each of us must come to him and believe. Not complicated, straightforward, but believe. Father, thank you for this section of gospel, the Gospel of John. Lord, would you instill in us that simple faith to follow you, to follow you simply, Lord. Please forgive us, Father, for all those times that we've made things more complicated than you ever wanted them to be. Or those times that we've approached you because we just want something from you. Father, would you cause each of us to continue to grow that we would desire you in a relationship with you more than the stuff. 
Be with us this afternoon, Father, whatever you've got before us. Guide us, direct us, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. God bless you.